I'm Dr. Mark Lorenzato discussing supplements used in Parkinson's disease and type 2 diabetes. It's not uncommon to see both of these together. The plan here is to understand the fundamentals of the Paleo Legacy model to create a supplement plan and plan to communicate the supplement plan with your health practitioner so you're on the same level. Managing daily or weekly regimens of supplements frequently with a pill box and monitor benefits and the risks of the supplementation. The basic idea of paleo legacy model is that our biochemistry, the pathways of our biochemistry have evolved over millions and hundreds of millions of years. We have enzyme systems in common with bacteria, yet we had radical departure from our evolving food ecology with civilization, a very radical change when we embraced starch, sugar, refined oils, we now fry things in oils, and use of salt. So the fundamental part of Paleo Legacy is to acknowledge that these things cause damage in the amounts we're getting, to lower the starch and sugar, to lower the refined oils. By this I mean corn oil, soy oil, safflower, sunflower. Also, dairy products are new since civilization. Therefore, cheeses, many of them, are very high in saturated fats without substantial amount of antioxidants and are damaging as well. So our dairy products are quite limited with our Paleo Legacy model. As well as this, the sodium causes problems from not just table salt, but sodium nitrates, sodium in preservatives, soy sauce, bacon, sausage, and things like this, lunch meats. We have to eliminate these from the diet as well. So first part of Paleo Legacy is getting our salt, sugar, starch, refined oils, very low in our diet. When we look at modern disease, the profile of what a physician sees as disease, we see many things that benefit from supplements. This suggests that those supplemented molecules were probably in our diet for quite some time, and now we're just returning them to define what our diet used to be. So we have insight in what humans used to eat by understanding when we supplement and find a benefit in that, it is very likely that supplement was part of our food before. From this basic concept, we can understand that humans probably ate 25 to 30 percent of their caloric intake from meat, far greater than we do today. And with that meat, the meat was range-fed. It was game meat. It ate vegetables, seeds, nuts, whatever it could find. It had a different composition of molecules than we get from eating meat that's, rained, that's fed corn and soy. So basically, some of the essential supplements we now are looking we need are those that are in meat, and we need them for two reasons. We had a greater percentage of meat in our diet, and the quality of meat was quite different. An exception to this is vitamin D. Vitamin D comes from the sunlight. When ultraviolet radiation hits our skin, this happens only in Northern California in the summer months, maybe June to July, August. Therefore, I recommend people supplement with vitamin D 2,500 to 5,000 international units a day from September to May unless they're not getting sunlight in the summer from sunscreen or they just don't get out, in which case they need to supplement year-round. It makes good sense to get a level in early winter, November, to see if you're in the range where you want to be. Usually a level between 35 and 75, 35 and 100 is what we're looking at in your bloodstream when you get that level. DHA and EPA are the omega-3 fatty acids most of us realize by that come from the ocean now, but they used to be in-game meat. That is why we became conditionally dependent upon them. We always had a source of them because we ate game meat regularly. So I do recommend one or two grams a day with meals of the omega-3s, DHA, and EPA. I myself eat salmon twice a week, and I do occasionally supplement with DHA and EPA for particular reasons. Acetyl L-carnitine or L-carnitine, both are a good source of carnitine. Carnitine is in amino acids. It is one of the more fundamental polypeptides or amino acid-derived molecules in meat. It is essential in our bodies for metabolizing fatty acids, for burning fat. L-carnitine can change your fatty acid composition. It can also help in many ways with your energy management. Absolutely diabetics 
should be supplementing with L-carnitine. Acetyl L-carnitine crosses the blood-brain be barrier better than L-carnitine, so for cognitive management, I recommend acetyl L-carnitine. Creatine as a powder form is what muscle builders take. It is not important to take high doses like they do, but it is one of the amino acid-derived molecules with three amino acids in red meat that is very critical. People that take carnitine and creatine are getting methionine, a critical amino acid, through those. Also getting arginine, a critical amino acid. So there's no need to supplement methionine or arginine when you're taking L-carnitine and creatine. Choline is a molecule that's very important in most of our membranes and our nervous system. It is in eggs, it is in lecithin, it is in many things. In meat, it is approximately for the amount we ate on a daily basis averaged probably 350 or 500 milligrams, so therefore I do recommend supplementing with that. Depends, you may actually want to do lecithin and look into that as well, or instead. Vitamin K2, vitamin Ks are involved in clotting, but they're also involved in bone strength and other things. And the vitamin K2 has a longer side chain in terms of its structure. This was uh, lengthened from the vitamin K1 in bacteria when they're fermented, but also, so we see it in some cheeses and uh, some fermented products, but also meat, game animals would convert vitamin K1 to K2. Since we're not getting meat as the amount we used to, we're now K2 deficient. K2 is critical for keeping our calcium in our bone as opposed to in our soft tissue. Nicotinamid, nicotinamid is one of the forms of vitamin B3. The other one is niacin. The other name for nicotinamid is niacinamid. Nicotinamid is part is partially responsible not just for energy management but for DNA short chain repair or short chain DNA repair. It helps us preserve our age. It slows changes that we don't want to happen. So nicotinamid at 1000 milligrams at bedtime can be very beneficial. It is relative to the amount of starch and unhealthy things you eat, just how much nicotinamide you actually need. But at this point, I recommend anybody with Parkinson's diabetes to be starting with 1,000 milligrams a day. They may end up lowering this, but there is not known up to three grams a day any problem with this dose. So our perspective on the paleo legacy, our enzyme systems are more or less inherited, complex, we're not really sure how we acquire all of our DNA. Some of it is brought to us by viruses. Um, other of it is evolving the parts of, part of evolution that's not clear. Clearly mutations are part of it. But we do understand that our enzyme systems predate us and we are in essence living fossils. We are a reflection of what biology, of what the thing we understand as life is going back for hundreds of thousands and hundreds of millions years. Therefore, we need to think in a longer time scale before we do abrupt changes like adding starch and sugar to our diet. If an individual is on thyroid medication, they should be cautious about their L-carnitine dose in two ways. It makes more sense to take it daily as opposed to episodically. And if they take it daily, every time they change a dose after a month, they should get thyroid function levels to make sure that it's not affecting their thyroid function. L-carnitine can be used in people with hyperthyroidism, very high thyroid levels in their bloodstream to mitigate problems. It does not cure hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. So a special look at Parkinson's disease. Sometimes people got into the problem of having Parkinson's, partially genetic, but a good por portion of it is from having too much fuel in your diet without the uh, essential maintenance molecules. This comes from starch eating. This comes from refined oil eating like dairy products and fried food. So we didn't know. We know better now. Not all of us understand this. I urge people to make the transition. At first, it's hard to give up sugar, but it's critical. The other aspect is you may need extra vitamin E. Vitamin E has a very bad reputation because there's been some bad science about it. The natural form is excellent for you at 400 international units, perhaps 800 international units a day. The synthetic form could be damaging. Many of the studies that say vitamin, D is, vitamin E is not good for you say that because they looked at the synthetic version. Therefore, Natural tocopherols, 
which are vitamin E's, 400 international units a day is recommended. Also, the vitamin C up to 1,000 milligrams a day, I highly recommend. Other considerations, if an individual does not eat vegetables, they need to take a vitamin B complex, such as B100 or B50 daily. They should know of the foods that are particularly beneficial in diabetic, diabetes if you are, avocados, salmon, walnuts, peanut butter without sugar or salt added, without high fructose corn syrup. Low glycemic fruits are those that are not tropical fruits, such as the oranges, lemons, grapefruits, high pectin foods such as crisp apples, crisp pears, crisp cherries. Meat can, is a, a large variety of good and not so good. Leaner meat such as pork loin, chicken, range-fed meat has the advantage over corn-fed or soy-fed meat, but it's very difficult to find the particulars of the meat you buy in general. Some vegetables are better than others, particularly broccoli, spinach, kale, and asparagus are very good. Corn is not so good, very high in starch. Flax seeds, pumpkin seeds can be good snacks. You should avoid certain foods, such as dried fruit, high in sugar, such as fruit juices like orange juice packed with sugar. Avoid bread, avoid potatoes, rice, cereals, the exception being oatmeal at a moderate amount. I like to have oatmeal with carrots and spinach and a few raisins in it with some spices as my morning snack. Um, one should avoid, as I said, corn and high, high saturated fat such as butter due to the fact that most people in this condition have some coronary artery disease. So processed food, bacon, lunch meat, ice cream, definitely none of that. Once again, the Paleo Legacy supplements look at the foods that we used to have in our diet that we no longer do. Much of the science saying one supplement is better than the other or this or that or is needed is on people who are not having a paleo diet to begin with. For instance, if we say that uh, choline is needed in very high doses, well, that may be because people were not getting uh, carnitine and creatine, which also produce methionine, which does one of the things that choline does. So if you're deficient of these other molecules, you're going to need more choline. So the exact dose, it's best just to mimic nature. That's what the Paleo Legacy does. diet does. In the case of disease processes, there is some more to be said, but this is where we start. Stabilize on these supplements and then go from there. I hope you use the accompanying PDF to make this easy. No need to take notes here. Very good.